Hello, hello. Welcome to a brand new episode of the SaaS Sprints podcast, the podcast for content marketers in SaaS. And I'm your host, Yag. In today's episode, we are going to discuss growth experiments, copy optimization, and a lot more so that we can do what works. Interestingly, our guest today is Andres Glusman, the CEO of Do What Works, a product that helps growth, marketing, and product teams accelerate their conversion rates. They track thousands of growth experiments from leading companies and arm you with what worked for the winners. Before Andre started Do What Works, he worked at Meetup for 14 years leading their growth. And now it's time for me to talk less and listen more. So hey ho, let's go. Hey Andres, I'm super happy to have you here. How's it going? It's going great, Yag. I'm really thrilled to be here with you. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. Right. So before you started Do What Works, you know, you you were with Meetup for 14 years managing the growth. So you helped them drive growth. And uh, from some of our previous conversations, I've often heard you say that about 80 to 90% of growth experiments actually fail. So let's talk about that. Why is that only one out of five experiments move the needle? What's going wrong? It's surprisingly large number of experiments that don't move the needle, mostly because surprising because people only really get up on stage and talk about all their successes and the times they won. But no one is, no one's talking about the 80% of the time where, where things did not go their way. And there's a great expression that says, you know, learning is what you get when you don't get what you want. And uh, <laughs> that's very much the uh, the case with experimentation. It, it's it's um, the reason we believe why 80% of experiments don't move the needle is because everyone who's running experiments is largely running them in isolation. Uh, so everyone who runs any experiment in and of themselves is recreating experiments that are likely being done at the exact same time or have been done by other people dozens or even hundreds of other times. And so you see people over and over again make a educated guess based on their assumptions or based on the information they have but unfortunately, you only get the data from an experiment when the data when the experiment's over. It's kind of the cruel yeah. joke. And, and so, the, uh, the as a result, a lot of people who you know really live and die, and their careers are kind of made by the ability to kind of learn quickly and isolate in and hone in on the things that work and double down on those things. You have to go through a process of of learning what doesn't work along the way, and the reason yeah. why the rates are so, so poor or the, I should frame it as the, the percentage of time you're only learning is so, is so high is because you're only learning from the, uh, from yourself. And so our, our hunch is that if you could learn from everyone else, you'd be in a much better spot and be able to sort of uh, learn from everyone else so that your win rates would go up. But isn't there also about a lot of context there, you know, like say we have to run experiments in isolation because the context and the result that I'm going for probably might not be the same where somebody like a Spotify does because the situation is different, the goals are different, the markets are different. So isn't it by design that these are always going to be isolated? It's a really great point, which is that um, not, well, is that people will behave in different ways in different circumstances. And so it's not really going to be the case that certain things are always good or always bad. It's always about who is it good for? Uh, and in this kind of situation, uh, what is the normal behavior that people are going to exhibit when they're working through this kind of a situation in a B2B context, for example, or in a consumer application where you're trying to sign up for a low cost subscription that costs a handful of dollars a month? You know, what's, what are the considerations that are going to be very different than when you're signing up for a uh, much, much larger ticket item, perhaps, you know, in, in a B2B SaaS product. But that being said, what you really want to do is there's still other people who are facing the almost exact same challenges as you. And sometimes they're your competitors. And sometimes they're not your competitors. Sometimes you can learn as much, if not more, from the people who are in a nearby space as you, who are not actually your competitors. So, you know, you could learn as much from, if you're in a B2B SaaS company, you could learn as much from Airtable as you can learn from your competitor when it comes to how do you lay out a pricing page. There's so many things that are sort of common. And as long as you can pick the right comparables, you can learn from them. And the, obviously, you need to take everything with a grain of salt. And it, just the fact that it worked for somebody else doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you. But the more often something works for somebody else that's very similar to you, or the more often it doesn't work for other people who are similar to you, the more it's a really great signal that, hey, maybe this is not worth investing the next month of my life into working on. And I should actually double down on these things that are much more likely to work or that have much stronger signal and really following your intuition there. Because really, 
let's acknowledge at the end of the day, when you're running experiments, the reason we're running experiments is we don't know. We're just guessing. And the more you've done it, the more you're able to hone in and learn and, and kind of really kind of isolate in on, on the right truth. But the, the key is, is to get to that truth as fast as you can with whatever data you can get your hands on. And if you can find the right set of data that's sort of comparable for you, then that gives you this great advantage or this great opportunity to not waste months of your life or months in a year uh, on the things that are just less likely to have been had a shot in the first place. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. In fact, it also kind of closely maps to how we look at things in the content world, because, you know, you might have a competitor that's not your direct competitor in terms of product, but they might be competing for the same set of keywords, for instance. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that makes a lot of sense. Right. So let's talk a little bit about um, when to run a test and when not to. Like, is there a scale or is there a time? Uh, how do you look at it? Yeah. In an ideal world, it would be amazing if you could test every single thing. Right. Wouldn't that be awesome? Because right when you're when you're not running tests, you're just making guesses and you're hoping that stuff you're, you're, you're working on will bear out. And you're sort of looking at the top line and saying, well, did it did, did the overall results seem to move directionally in the right direction or not? Uh, but unfortunately, you don't really know. It's just that it was a sunny day out today and therefore everyone happened to be buying my product or not, right? So when you're running experiments, you're actually truly learning. And what could be better than actually having <laughs> your finger on the pulse of what works and doesn't work? And so like when I was in leading growth at Meetup, we were early pioneers in the lean startup movement. I was enamored with and I got addicted to this idea that, wow, I can learn everything. I don't have to guess anymore. I can hone in and like feel like empowered and feel confident that I have a truth. And so as a result, what ended up happening is I doubled the size of my team. We doubled the number of experiments and I still wasn't running enough experiments for my one. And then I doubled it again. And, and I still felt like I was constrained or not running things because ultimately what ended up happening is I got, you get so addicted to knowing that you're right. And it's so nice to feel right. <laughs> that you ultimately want to, you, you want to test every single thing you can. And then you start thinking back to your high school science class and your professor is, you know, and saying, oh, the proper way to run an experiment is to isolate every single variable into its smallest possible measure. And now you start testing pixel by pixel by pixel by pixel, and you start testing the smallest possible things. And the good news is you get rewarded with, with answers and with truth. And, and the bad news is that you spend months and months and months on things that you're starting up that aren't that a consequential. And so the, the, the answer to your question is really that it depends on the level of risk and impact for the thing you want to do. And so if it's really important to know that you're right, if it's really important to the business to hone in on this specific user experience, this specific set of words or messaging, this is going to apply everywhere. You know, that's a really big deal. And that's what you want to use as much as you possibly can on your highest volume areas. In places where it's really inconsequential or where, the, where the, the upside potential is not so high, is very limited, or in instances where the risk is not very great. Are you, are you betting your entire business? If you're betting your entire business, I would recommend finding a small way of running a test first, right? To signal that it's a good way of doing it. Um, if the test in and of itself, if the consequences of being wrong are very low, well, then it really doesn't matter that much. And you can move forward and not run an experiment, which sounds sacrilegious to somebody, you know, to come from me, who's somebody who's really kind of made his living running experiments and being successful at them. The reality is, is that there are times when running tests is a waste of time. And those times are when it's not of, when the downside risk is not very high or when the upside potential is not very high, are the two times when you don't necessarily want to run tests. And you want to run tests where there is a huge upside or downside and two is where there's a fair amount of uncertainty that if you can get some knowledge beforehand or get some knowledge around will dramatically improve your odds of having a huge hockey stick return or, or not, you know, cratering your business into the ground. Yeah. Yeah. No, when I think about it, you know, typically in the SMB SaaS world, we are always like pick a lane and go because the speed to market is more important than uh, getting it hundred percent right all the time. But I, I also get your point where you say that it, it depends on how, how much of a risk are we willing to take in that moment. So maybe if you can give us an example of some of the tests that you ran and what is the magnitude of uh, the risk that they were going with? Is it like, say, before spending a huge ad budget, they were trying to run a small uh, experiment or what kind of experiments, if you can take us with that? Yeah, I mean, the places where I've had the most success with my experimentation um, often flow back from the places where the bottom line is affected in some important way. 
Right. And so, geez, thinking back here. So some examples within, within, um, you know, for example, is, is all of our revenue came from running from organizers and they all use the subscription product. And so figuring out how to market that subscription part product was extremely important. What's the user experience that people should go through in the process of becoming an organizer? What's the process by which you onboard them? Uh, what's the process by which you make them feel welcomed? Uh, all these things that lead to the kind of early stage retention. These are areas right now that are the most, were the most important variables for this product. Truth be told, it's the most important variables with every subscription product is really sort of how do you acquire a customer? How do you onboard them? How do you activate them? How do you keep them around? Those were the areas where we had the biggest impact. And so for us, we really often isolated into, okay, on an onboarding flow, on a new, new, new user experience, it was the experiments that tied to explaining what users were getting, explaining to users, conveying to users the, 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 the value. And so it's really around the messaging and angles related to getting somebody started. And then there was a series of other experiments related to like onboarding as well, which we could dive into. I'm sort of torn here between some different angles we can take uh, with regard to the experiments. But in the, the general answer to your question is really around isolating in on the experiments where, where the impact was made was where there was a direct flow working backwards from revenue or the number one places uh, where running experiments made the biggest difference. Right. So can we think of it like, say, running A-B tests of uh, landing page copies versus, you know, like, say, how uh, subtle changes on a pricing page works, things like that? Yeah. So there's a few there. So I'll stick with the Meetup example. Maybe we can find uh, we, we can jump to something else in a minute too. But the, uh, it, within Meetup, for example, we had a, an interesting challenge around discouraging the wrong, like figuring out how to weed out the wrong kind of user yeah. in order to reduce the costs of make, of managing them out. So there's people who were attracted to becoming organizers who were sort of shady, who wanted to just promote businesses. And we were trying to create real community. And so we had this program uh, we're trying to figure out ways of reducing the number of the wrong kind of people coming in who are going to create a bad experience for other people. So uh, our CEO said to us, hey, look, what, what if we put a check mark? Let's, let's, let's require everyone to acknowledge that they're going to create real life community. So put some friction into the process and create a check mark. And we said, Scott, that's a terrible idea. We're going to lose a ton of revenue if we do this. And he said, no, no, I really think we should do this. I said, well, fine, let us quantify how much money we're going to lose by doing it. So we ran it as an experiment so we could quantify exactly how much money we would lose. And we put this check mark in, in the process, adding the friction in that said, you have to check this in order to go through this onboarding flow. Well, of course we run the test and we look at the results and we're sort of bracing ourselves for the absolute worst. And we look up and we're like, wait, there's a 16% lift here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> adding this friction in um, actually not only reduced the cost, it actually increased the likelihood that people were going to go ahead and become organizers. And we weren't hundred percent sure why. I mean, our hypothesis is that people were, it really conveyed the value of what you're doing and made people feel like they're more of, a, of an exclusive club. And so we see folks uh, engaging in these kinds of experiments. Oh, so we see the folks that went through that process. We knew not only did they, do we not lose money, we actually saw that they were much more likely to take off and become uh, stronger organizers in the future. So it was a really cool experiment in that way, but things like that, that are counterintuitive, that are really almost always your assumptions that are like about what you definitively believe to be true based on a conventional wisdom are so often proved wrong. Yeah. And it's so easy to prove them wrong if you go through the experiment. Right. And, and so that's a perfect example there, but to your question, language makes a huge difference. The copy on buttons makes a huge difference. The layouts make a huge difference. The number of plans, the layout, how you convey discounts, how you convey promotions, do you, when you collect people's email addresses, all of the different variables that you're probably experimenting with, the, the, the reality is they actually make a difference. And uh, and that's what, those are the kinds of things you want to experiment with. Yeah, yeah. No, love that. Uh, you know, we also, in uh, the previous company that I worked for, uh, the company called Avoma, we made a very interesting experiment wherein we said, hey, for signups, we will not encourage Gmail or any generic emails. We'll accept only business emails. And, and then, you know, we had that through SSO. And uh, interestingly, what it did to us was instead of taking us through, say, lower number of uh, signups, it actually increased our signup to conversion rate. So we decided, we saw that, you know, only the right kind of people were coming in and uh, the the bogus signups were actually totally taken out. I love it. So do you, you, when somebody typed in Gmail, like, you know, Andres, you know, whatever the thing is at gmail.com, uh, it would say like, nope, you must use a work email address. I love that. We, um, I'm actually, I was literally just thinking about doing that for, uh, for anything I'm rolling out right now. So that's, that's pretty awesome. 
Yeah, no, that's just such a strong, it's a, it's a great, it's a great point of view. And if you really think it through, which is sort of around isolating out the things that are the low quality and, and be, be able to double down, it's, it's a bold move because you'd think, no, I only, I want more leads, but sometimes it's more of the better that that raises the bar. Yeah, for sure. It's awesome. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have a framework to uh, run these experiments successfully? So what what is the typical framework that you take while you approach these? Yeah. You know, in terms of finding the, the best path, you know, the first, first and foremost, it's, isolating in and understanding where is your highest volume. So highest volume, highest risk is the number one thing. And um, the second question is sort of what are you solving for? Are you solving for growth? Are you solving for other options? I tend right now to focus a lot on growth because that's where all you know these 15,000 plus experiments that we see are all isolated and on growth. So that's very much front and center in my mind. And then within growth, it's sort of where are the most important pages that you're going to flow through. So the head of Asana's growth program calls these golden pages. I wish I invented this term, but I can't take credit for them. I promised him I'd give him credit, but it's like what these golden pages. So what is a golden page? It is your homepage. It's your pricing page. It's your sign up page. It's like all of these high value, high importance pages. And there's really only like maybe like five to 10 that really truly matter. Your, S, your, your, your landing pages, et cetera, or small improvements there make a huge difference. So one is just by understanding where is your high potential areas, which are these golden pages. Then, of course, there's sort of a framework that a lot of people use with experimentation, which is known as uh, RICE, reach, impact, confidence, and uh, effort. And so reach is sort of related to golden pages. You, you want your highest reach areas to possibly to, to be there or your highest importance. So every customer needs to go through this experience. It may not be the high, it, it's, it's relative to the reach of all your customers. It's, it's one of those important pages. Effort is a very important metric too, which is sort of around, well, how, how hard is it going to be to launch? And usually you quantify that in terms of days, weeks, months of engineering effort to run, right? Or to get off the ground or cost to, to launch. Maybe if you're running an experiment inside your advertising. Effort's relatively easy to estimate. You just sort of estimate and then you double it and then double it again. And usually you're about right, right? So you, people over, overestimate how long or how quickly they can get things done. The remaining two though are sort of sadly like challenging, which is confidence and, and, and impact because you don't know the impact until it's done. So the really the last thing you can really have is a framework for confidence. And so the question is sort of how confident are you that it's going to work? And there you can draw confidence from things like I used to work. I did this at my last company. It worked really well. We should do this here. That gives me a lot of reason to believe. You know, I spoke with a friend of mine who is at a similar kind of company as mine. It gives me a lot of reason to believe. Looking at other people's experiments through like do what works, that gives you a lot of reason to believe. You look at usability sessions, gives you reasons to believe that maybe point you in the direction saying this matters or it doesn't matter. And you very quickly want to isolate there. Now, what you really need to know is that at the earlier stages, the level of error there is really high and you're just guessing, but your goal is to guess better than 80% fail rate. So if you can beat 80% fail rate, that's a huge leg up. And that's what you want to be doing. If you can, you know, instead of winning eight and 10 times, you win seven and 10 times or no, the way around. Instead of uh, losing uh, eight and 10 times, you, you lose seven and 10 times. You've just improved your win rate by 50% is how the math works. Right, right. No, that makes sense. And I love the term golden page because it, it almost sounds like uh, a money shot in a movie, right? So you say that this is the money shot. But let's let's talk about it. You know, like say, for example, as content marketers, what we do is we typically start with the strategy and then have a hypothesis of how to get, uh, get there using content. And then we go about testing say, by creating a set of pages, distributing it, and then looking at what converts versus which ones drives more traffic, but more of noise versus conversion. And then, you know, one of the places where I heard you speak, which really, you know, widened my eyes is where you said that a guess becomes an experiment when you are testing it and looking for specific signals. And in that regard, you spoke about isolating it. So let's let's talk about isolation. What do you mean by isolation? And because when you when you isolate, Sometimes there's a chance that you tend to lose the context of what you're doing it for. So there is a workflow that things happen before and after. So does isolation still, you know, give you the same results when you take out other conditions of standard temperature and pressure? Yeah, the reason to isolate from a, is, is, is really, that comes from scientific method. And, and so the more that you can isolate the variables that you're testing, the more confidence you can generally feel that the change the, the the outcome change that you've seen is driven by the systematic change and the things that you've isolated beforehand it'd be lovely if the world was like if human if everything was like very 
like logical and, and, and humans always behave in the exact same way all the time. And there was kind of one lever that moved them all. You know, there are things that work in isolation. There are things that, that you need pairs of in order to work. So, you know, you could say, well, people don't like eating hot dogs. Maybe they don't like eating hot dogs when you're going to offer them a hot dog in a bun. Sometimes you need hot dogs and buns in order to, to get people to, to buy the thing, right? And if you're just changing one thing without offering the whole package, well, then you're, then you're, uh, you're in trouble. So there's, when you sort of say isolating, you want to isolate in on sort of the smallest possible, in an ideal world, you want to isolate in on the smallest possible unit of change that makes sense for a, a consumer to be able to materially do the job they want to do. And so it could be isolating in, in, in an ideal world. Yeah, it would be lovely to just isolate in on button copy and then isolate in on button shape and then isolate in on these other things. The, the trade-off for, for being isolated is having too narrow an aperture. You can think of the camera with an aperture. If your focus is too narrow and too small, well, you sometimes are just operating much, much, much too narrowly to actually be able to deliver a kind of on the holistic solution. And so maybe instead of the, in certain instance situations, it makes a lot of sense to hone in on the mechanics by which somebody uses the experience. Like what does the button copy say? Sometimes though, the larger problem is that there's a lack of an understanding of how it works, for example. And conveying how it works, you probably don't wanna do it in an isolated way. There's a series of changes that you make in conveying how something works. And so it's not the kind of thing that, well, you know, so one question is whether or not you're conveying it at all, and then the how. And you could run a lot of experiments within how you convey how it works. But again, you just want to manage that trade-off of finding the combinations of things that make the most sense. And what you're really looking for are the things that have the highest likelihood of being positive drivers of change or having a positive outcome for you related to the outcome you're looking to see. So a strong correlation with the outcomes you're looking to see. Right, right. So how Im one impacts the other things in the flywheel, and it's not like, give me one lever long enough so that I can move the world. That's not how it works. That, that's exactly right. I mean, if, and, and there are certain levelers that are just really powerful. I'm, I'm surprised. I mean, we had somebody tell us the other day that they had hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of impact uh, from just changing button copy, which was unbelievably cool. One of our clients reported that, which is such a cool, cool thing, you know, but it's one of those things where not, it won't affect like, that thing that worked in that instance is not necessarily so therefore every button should say this thing on every page. It's really very dependent on the uh, situation that you're trying to solve for. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Sometimes, you know, because of these reasons that uh, the world of CRO has reduced to change that button color and everything will change. That's not how it's going to be. It's true. Although but here's a funny, funny fact, which is that most people, when they get their hands on, on a new CRO product, you know, the ability to run tests, the first thing they change is button color because that's super easy. And so they change all the buttons from red to green or all the buttons from blue to yellow or whatever the case may be. Almost every experiment I've seen uh, looking across a series of experiments related to button color, where you're changing all buttons in, to, from one color to the other, has no material impact. Right, right. Yeah, totally makes sense. All right. So here's uh, one of my favorite, you know, things that I've heard from one of the recent podcasts where you were a guest on and uh, you were talking about it was never uh, it has never been easier to uh, ship products but it's very very hard to ship the right ones and that for some reason has stuck with me so let's let's talk a little bit about that yes i understand that today in the world of ai with the world of chat gpt everything has become so easy but now that we have so many things to build context people are building you know in public and getting feedback as quickly as possible but still why are people not able to deliver the kind of product that will really resonate with people or the solve solve something that is painful enough. Yeah, it's it's um, it's you're hundred percent right in that. Like the AI has made it, it's going to make it easier and easier to write content and to write co and to to have the the copy and to generate imagery. It's true for you. It's true for everyone else. It's true for every single thing. The no code solutions are making it easier to generate user experiences that approximate what an end user would have. You know, you don't need to actually rig up a form on your site, you can now use a type form to get things going. So it's easier than ever to get things started. And even at the highest level, there's li like code libraries and things of the sort make it much, much easier. AWS, all these different pr platforms make it easier and easier to actually launch things. In a world where things are more easily launched, there's much more noise and much more abundant. There's more offerings and more options for users. And so the ability to actually re get through and re reach people and reach people in a way that actually matters to them is gonna, is harder and harder. And it's, it's an unfortunate truth, which is that it's easier than ever. Now, what you just said was really great, which is you said, well, you know, you can actually work in public and you can start to get faster loops and you can use 
the products you're building to actually, uh, you can approach the way that you build in a way that gives you rapid cycles, knowing that there's error in what you're doing, getting the feedback yeah. in certain ways, knowing that you don't want to read too much in any one piece of insight, but also knowing that, Hey, because if I can set the right expectation, I can learn very quickly. Like we're launching a brand new product right now in, in related to using our technology to help people uh, optimize their ad copy. So be able to write more effective ad copy that shows up in search ads because we have this engine that's detecting all these, you know, detecting winning and losing variants of ads in terms of what messaging was working and not working in search ads, and then being able to use AI to apply that to helping them more effectively optimize their ads and also then suggest ads for them to use based on the winning and losing variants with data trained by winners and losers. It sounds like a really cool idea. Is it? We think it is a cool idea. <laughs> the way we're launching it though has been to work with early users and get them access to this platform and really work directly with them on every single release cycle understanding their workflow, understanding what they're trying to do, understanding where the problems lie, where their frustrations lie, and then chipping away at it and showing them stuff. And then them saying, no, that actually made my life more difficult and us having to scrap it. <laughs> right? and, then, and, then, and then moving it back and then kind of doing, going at it in a different way and going at a different way and just having the discipline to launch it in smaller and smaller batches to keep them in the process long, as we go has made a profound impact on the actual product we've launched. We did the same thing with our original product that we launched with a few years ago, and this is what we're doing with this new one. So working in public or working directly with users every step of the way, just setting the right set of expectations is, is huge. Uh, letting them know that, hey, this is going to be a little bumpy at times, but but it's going to be really tailored to your specific needs works really well. The advantage, that's sort of the drawing in and being, being able to be on the side. I mean, the reality though is that people are getting bombarded now with all kinds of offerings. And it's, it's, it's almost cliche to say that I have AI X, Y, and Z. That's, that's sort of a commodity now. The AI is very quickly getting to a point where it just doesn't even matter. It's around how do you solve my problem? How are you type, how are you customizing the AI to match my workflow? This is the kind of stuff that we're matching. So all in, yes, is it easier to like the, the AI suddenly got really good, really quick. And suddenly we can really make good recommendations. It only matters if we can make those recommendations based on good data. It only matters if we can make those recommendations in a way that's tied to their workflow. And the only way you get that is by kind of experimenting with your customers, not, not on your customers, uh, but experimenting with your customers on the th problem they're trying to solve. I love that. You know, this is a phrase I'm going to write down, experimenting with the customers and not on your customers. <laughs> like <Lara. laughs> I, I think it's a blog post in the making for sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you also reminded me of an interesting part. You know, one of our very first guests on the podcast, uh, you know, the chief creative officer of uh, ClickUp, she said, when I asked her, like, what was your biggest learning from the last product launch? She, they had launched a massive ClickUp 3.0 launch and they said, the biggest learning that she had was instead of making one huge launch, she would have preferred to do it in smaller pieces with uh, each segment separately to test it and iterate it faster so that she could have learned much more quicker. And you exactly said the same thing. It, it kind of resonates and immediately reminded me of that. It's a belief that I share with her because I've done it in both ways. And every single time I do it in the way that's sort of a big, big, big bang, big release, I regret it. I'll tell you a story. We, we launched a thing at Meetup, which was one of those bet the, bet the farm kind of, kind of moves. And, um, it was a time where there's just a lot of like desire to create a lot of, I, I wasn't in charge of product at the time, but, but, but there's a, there's a real strong desire to, to launch this brand new experience and rethink the way things worked. Um, and there are so many assumptions that were changed along the way and towards the moving towards this big bet. And months and months and months went by where we sort of were like working towards this big new idea, this vision led approach, but we didn't validate kind of the key steps and sort of what does it actually mean for people who are trying to do X, Y, and Z along the way. And lo and behold, when we launched it, it was like one of the most difficult launches you could possibly <laughs> have. You can, as you can imagine where people are saying, this doesn't help me at all. This actually hurts me a lot. And it was because it was this like big reveal. And, and one of the biggest things I learned in the process was like, like, even if you want to fundamentally test different assumptions or the different pieces have to come together in a certain way. So you can't isolate them in. You can find ways of approximating any user experience you want to really truly validate the, a user experience that you're thinking about launching. And so there's ways of getting signal about anything in a smaller way. And even just, you know, at my at do what works, if, if if we're working on something and we haven't put something in front of a customer in, in, in the 
like in an increment of weeks, if, if, if like if four weeks go by, I feel very unsteady. I feel very uneasy about whatever it is that we're working on. It feels very uncomfortable because we just haven't been able to like get the idea in front of people fast enough, which makes me just have these PTSD flashback moments of, of these kind of big reveals and, and, and big, big launches. I'll say one more thing here on, on this the theme, which is that one of the ideas that you can, that I picked up from the lean community that I was a part of in the, uh, in the early 2000s is this idea that there's product launches and there's marketing launches and they don't need to be the same. And so you can have product launches that are series of smaller iterative product launches that change the product over time. And then there's a marketing launch that says, okay, after these 19 things have all been released and are stitched together, we're going to relabel it. We're going to repackage the whole thing as, you know, click up 3.0 or whatever 3.0. And now that's the marketing launch. That's the launch. So the functionality has been out there for a long time in different ways. You're now just kind of organizing it and drawing attention to it in a different way. And the marketing launch can then be this big wow factor with a marching band and fireworks but really all of the underlying assumptions have been validated like along the way. This is absolute gold, Andres. You know, this is absolute gold. I love it. Awesome. All right. So with that, uh, let's move to the second part of the podcast, which we call the rapid fire section. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot five questions at you. The questions may be short, but the answers need not be. And you can speak whatever comes to your mind. So are you ready? Let's do it. Here we go. All right. So here's question number one. What's one commonly held growth tip that you absolutely disagree with? Conventional wisdom. And so what I have seen so often in my career, and I've been so shocked to find, and this is from the start of my career on, um, but you see this over and over and over again, is that I think we all understand that humans are make a lot of good decisions based on bad assumptions. And so there's a lot of bad outcomes that happen as a result. And at the individual level, it's very rational. For some reason, though, conventional wisdom is really just the aggregation of all of those assumptions repeated by humans over and over and over again for extended periods of time, where therefore that's how it's done and that's how it should be done. But if you really stop and think about it and unpack it and go back to first principles, so many things that are tied to conventional wisdom are being done for the wrong reasons and don't actually matter. And this is why I love experimentation. This is kind of the thing that shocked me when I first started in this industry in the late nineties is the ability to look at how people were doing stuff. And in the late nineties, everyone was you know, spending as much money as they possibly could to get on these things called portals, which was Yahoo and Lycos and various other things to grow as much as they could, to impress some investors, to then, you know, try and get an IPO out the door and make as much money as they could and then worry about things later. Well, of course there was a collapse, right? That's not too dissimilar from what just happened a few years ago in the last cycle as well. And they keep repeating themselves over and over again because there's a conventional wisdom. There's a conventional approach that everyone has agreed that this is how we're doing it now. So often though, it's divorced from the reality of the underpinnings of like, what are you solving for? What's actually happening in the world? And is this sustainable? And it's when you run the experiments, when you actually run things and bring it back to the first principles to say like, is this actually work or not work? That it's very easy to predict, well, it, even in even in the process, if you're willing to buck the system, what it is that you should do. So I guess it's it's a bit of a cop out because it's not a specific thing, but it's it's just in conventional wisdom in general drives me nuts. No, yeah, no, that absolutely makes sense. You know, people say all sorts of things. People say, right for humans, duh. Yeah, obviously. But <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I get it. Cool. So here's question number two. What is your pick, being data-driven or being data-informed? I mean, I came across you speaking these two things. I didn't even know that these two were different. What's wonderful about our, te- our industry is that you have the opportunity to c- gather data all the time on what you're working on. And the way that you're gathering data gives you insights around what's working or not working. There's a lot of error all the way through, and there's a, a lot of opportunity to take any piece of data and run with it. And so the difference between being data-driven and data-informed is whether or not you, how you interpret the data. And so when people say data-driven, it's almost as if they're, they've taken the human out of the equation and they haven't necessarily said that we're going to analyze it. It's if X happens, then Y. If, if, if I see X, I need to do Y. If I see Z, I need to do A, whatever the case may be. When you're data-informed, 
the best way that I like to frame this is basically stealing from my friend, Eric Reese, kind of real founder of the Lean Startup Movement. He uh, you know, says, you want to work on behalf of your customers, not at their request. And so it's like these things as we're rolling out these new products, I'm very careful not to run from one side of the ship too quickly to the other side of the ship when I hear a piece of feedback, because I need to interpret it and understand what are they solving for and what's their situation and how much do they look like my other customers that I want to solve for in the future. And so when you're data informed, I think it's really more around sort of understanding that you're working at the, on behalf of your customers more than you are going to be saying, okay, when I see X, I need to do Y. And I'm only going to, I'm, I'm taking the human out of, it. I'm taking judgment out, which is the opposite of what we're trying to achieve as an industry. Right, right. So data informed it is. Yeah, makes sense. All right. So here's question number three. For the free plan on a SaaS pricing page, would you use the word free or would you put zero dollars? That's a good question. I'm trying to remember the experiment that I saw. So we recently saw an experiment related to that in terms of how it's called out. So this is an experiment I've seen on a few occasions. And if I'm remembering correctly, it's free, uh, F-R-E-E, -E, as opposed to zero dollars uh, has generally been on the winning side. Of, of the experiments we've seen, which I think is super fascinating. And I have a theory as to why that is, but, uh, but my theory behind that is, is sort of left side, le emotion driven versus uh, data driven, or, you know, kind of let left side of your brain, right side of your brain. And so it's one of those things where I think free is a very, it's like speaks to the emotion and zero dollars speaks to the, uh, speaks to your mathematical brain. And so I think on that kind of a choice, you're more likely to be affected by, by free. Makes sense. Absolutely. Here's question number four, which is based on just what you mentioned. You said always work on behalf of the customer and not on the request. I would love for you to expand on that. Yeah, when you're working uh, on behalf of the customer, it's around having really great conversations and being really curious about the obje their objective and their workflow. And so when I spoke, speak to people that I really want to understand is, okay, what are you trying to accomplish? How are you trying to do it now? And really truly understanding every step of the way as though I'm a four-year-old and I'm trying to learn, trying to replicate the steps and learn how to do it so that I could do it. That's, that's really what I mean in terms of like being able to understand and, and working on their, uh, on their behalf is when you truly understand what they're doing. Well, instead of changing the colors of items in a column or and instead of like changing the size of columns X, Y, and Z in, in a table, for example, Maybe what you really should just do is get rid of those three columns and make make that step go away. And so, oftentimes, when you're working on somebody's on somebody's behalf, your solutions are more often than not driven by removing steps from their process. Um, and when you're acting at their at their request, more often than not, you're kind of knee jerk reaction adding stuff. Uh, and so, if you sort of look at the ratio of stuff you've built and think about like, okay, what percentage of the time is am I adding stuff versus removing stuff? From, from, from a workflow, uh, odds are very good that if you're kind of leaning too much into adding things in, you're just acting on in response to requests you're hearing without truly understanding what it is that they're trying to do, because subtraction is more often the most powerful way of getting it done. Right, right. Yeah, this reminds me of a lot of uh, customer conversations that I've had in the past where, you know, a lot of feature requests, when you actually get into the conversation and try to understand what they want to do, then you can suggest that, hey, here's a better way of doing that using the product than making it as a feature request. And if I take all of these feature requests, I'm going to end up with a bloated product that nobody wants to use. That's right. And in, in, in your process, it often means having more conversations early on around the problem set and around the problem space and not getting to a solution too fast, especially when you're talking with your designers and engineers. So if you don't bring fully baked solutions to engineers, this is gonna sound controversial in some circles, but really rely on engineers to be able to help be an integral part of solving the problem, you're gonna get much, much better solutions if they're solving for the overall holistic solution as opposed to solving for the question of like, how quickly can this be built is probably the wrong question. It doesn't often lead to the most innovative solutions, that you can have for uh, for your customers. Right, right. No, absolutely. All right, so here's the final rapid fire question. If you had only $1,000 as your marketing budget, what would you bet it on? Great question. I don't want to sound like I'm pandering. You, you, I should probably say content, right? But uh, <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> uh, what would I bet it on for $1,000 as the marketing budget? It's going to depend heavily on heavily on the on the application, clearly. I would say actually to bet it on maybe not just content, but content plus distribution. And so like hiring somebody who can get you connected with 
like distribution and getting the distribution through like getting the good stuff that you have out into the world in that way. So can you hire somebody who can help form relationships with uh, all the blogs out there, with the influencers, with whomever, you know, with the podcasters out there and, and have you be guest featured on different podcasts, for example, that would probably be one of the best thousand dollars you could spend just from an amplification point of view. If that's the only place you could spend the money or in being super generous with something that creates goodwill in your community that you have. Uh, so can you find a way to spend $1,000 to really do something meaningfully interesting that creates a lot of goodwill in whatever community you're on? If you're targeting bands, if you're targeting whomever, is there one thing that could be done that would, I don't know what the one thing would be, but could a scholarship, could you create a scholarship? I, I, don't, I don't know what the one thing would be that would get a lot of attention and, 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 and uh, virality, but those would be the places to, to spend the money. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, especially when you said uh, distribution on the marketing side, that's the ultimate moat that one can get because creating content is one thing, but today who owns distribution is the one who owns a lot of things. So yeah, it's going to mean a lot. And I love the other answer as well. You know, of course, goodwill is something that will help you in the long term, but it, it does take a long time to establish that. Awesome. All right. So you hit all questions out of the park. That's brilliant. And for the listeners of the podcast, you know, if they want to connect with you, what's the best place to find you? Where do you hang out the most? Our, our website is dowhatworks.io. And I tend to hang out on LinkedIn. That's the, uh, that's the happy place on the internet right now. That's where I, where I really like to spend time. Really lots of good people there with a lot of great content. So that's where I like to hang out. Absolutely. And um, do you have a parting message for our listeners? Yeah. I mean, I guess it would be just that... Um, you know, signal is everywhere. And so you can learn. There's so many places to learn. There's so much that can be learned. There's so many different signals that are out there that can point you to beating the odds and doing better than 80% fail rate. And that can really get you more likely to hone in on the things that matter and the things that work and to just do the things that work. And so if you're just willing to, if you can figure out how to look, your ability to find the shortest path to truth and the shortest path to winning is, is much more prevalent than, than people normally realize. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I especially love the name Do What Works. So maybe you can also tell a little story about how you came up with the name. Yeah, the name, first of all, has originated from being a you know, leading product for years where this is one of the frustrations where we would often look for solutions. You hear people bring solutions and you're like, it was just too clever by a half. And and there were times when you could just do what works. You, you don't have to reinvent this part of the wheel. Our innovation doesn't have to go here. Let's innovate it on the, on these other parts. Let's do so it really started with a little bit of a... Uh, a refrain that I used to say to my team a lot, let's just do what works. Why, why are we reinventing the wheel here? Let's figure out what works and just do what works. And then for me, that actually became one of my daily mantras, as it turns out. So and when I uh, when I journal, I like to journal. It's just one of the things I, I sort of start my day writing down, pre-launching Do What Works, and, and here we go. So that, that little mantra actually became the name when I started thinking about, well, what is it that we want to be? Like, how does it represent us? It was literally right there on the paper in front of me that I had written down <laughs> every day for the last 365 days. So uh, it, was, it was just too, too obvious and too good to, to not use. No, that's awesome. You know, you become what you repeat yourself every single day. And <laughs> it's you really are true. Living proof of that. <laughs> it's one hundred percent true. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Andres. It was so much fun talking to you, and uh, really, really appreciate you making the time and appreciate my pleasure. This. Yeah, you're one of a kind. My, my pleasure.